I'm well on my way now with the Snow Leopard painting. The big master class painting that I'm doing of Snow Leopards. If you haven't already, have a look at the Snow Leopard I repainted after rubbing the old one out. I think it's in the previous vlog to this one. But yeah, I thoroughly enjoy painting that snow leopard scene. And because there's no way I could study them up close or even get to their destination just now that I have to study them on the TV. YouTube's a good place. Lots of snow leopard films on there. So I have to gather my reference material from other people who have done very hard work as well to film them and photograph them and whatnot. A little bit back, because of this reason, I sent off for some reference photographs from a wildlife photographer artist who supplied me with a disc full of images of the snow leopards and other animals as well. Uh, I think it cost me about five, six pound a disc which was really really good but it was a lot of years back. I don't know if it's the same but yeah if you can't get reference material, photographs etc of your specified subject you're going to do. Look, look on the internet. Wildlife photographers, filmmakers and artists are willing to sell you the reference material and sell you the copyright which I have. Keeps you in the right. And it's also very interesting to watch. So, the other day I sat and watched about two to three hours of snow leopards, looking through photographer pictures and whatever, just to get in that mood, get into that feeling of being in the Himalayas and whatever, the snow capped mountains getting in amongst the snow leopards, as you may say, to get into that feeling. It certainly works. That big painting I'm doing of the snow leopards, it's a long-term project. It's going to take me probably the best part of another year to get the majority of it finished. But it'll come never ever rush a painting take your time with it you can always tell when a painting's been rushed too hastily finished look at all the old artists way back in time some of their paintings that you are now seeing in museums took them many years to do i seen one the other day it took the guy uh, 25 years to complete and when you look at the painting it's a beautiful painting but you would never have man man uh, imagined that it was 25 years in the making maybe two or three you would think but if somebody was to tell you 25 years you'd look at it you'd look at it more deeply again <laughs> but there you are yeah don't wash things. I just seen a beautiful wildlife site that I'm going to share with you. A magpie. I was following it with the binoculars. Just about to start filming it when it dived into the rhododendron bush where 
the pheasant was and the pheasant gave out such a squeal and I looked over and the magpie is chasing the pheasant from the seed. When I was a kid, younger, I used to go out on the countryside along the lanes, the trackways, and collect the blackberries, the brambles as we call them, for my mum to make bramble jam. My lips are smacking just <laughs> thinking about it. Mum made beautiful bramble jam. I've tried them in the shops recently and mum's comes out tops. As always, mum's are always the best, aren't they? But it was. She had the recipe for a great bramble jam. I used to watch her at the kitchen table. Uh, once she had strained well, when she had boiled the brambles in a pot, she used to get an old clout, an old clouty, that was an old net, gauze net, and she used to strain the brambles into another bowl, the juice of the brambles, and then mix it in with sugar, dash of lemon and stir it on the stove until it came to the boil and the done that in the setting of it I used to watch my mum take a big tablespoon and drip some into a saucer with cold water and she knew exactly when it was ready to put into the jars. Yeah, mum's bramble jam. I don't think she does it as often now. She can't get out and about as often now to collect the brambles. Everything in Scotland, I'm talking about the flowers, the trees, the shrubs, the bushes, they're all slow to emerge in the springtime, more so than down south in England and over in Ireland, where their climate is just that little bit warmer. So they have daffodils those are dendrums, you name it, all before Scotland. Us up in the mountains and the hills, the temperature is a little bit slower to revive, to awaken. So hence, it's a bit scarce here, as you can see. Not many spring flowering at the moment, but we get a little bit of heat, like today, and things will start to sprout as normal, and we will catch up. I once uh, judged it. I had a few trips down to London and boy, it's a lot more warmer down there than it is up here. But I judged it. I uh, researched over many years 
and there is two weeks of a difference between down in London and up here in Perthshire, Scotland. Yeah, two weeks of a difference. But when they start down in London getting their daffodils, spring flowers and shrubs and whatever, trees start growing, their leaves. Yeah, it takes two weeks to come up here. In fact, if you probably had a camera above Great Britain and you time-lapsed it, you would see the gradual green coming in from down south up to Scotland just gradually over those two weeks. Somebody's maybe actually done that already to see how the temperatures vary. But yeah, it's fascinating. But as I says, after a couple of weeks we catch up and everything's normal for the springtime. I'm out and about today again, feeding the birds and the animals with their seed and their crumbs. <laughs> yeah, getting back to normal again. This is the second day this week I've been out, so yeah, and it's sunshine today. Well, warmer anyway, cloudy. The sun comes in and out. Uh, sporadically. It's nice, there's a nice breeze as well just to keep that but I noticed this morning when I got up the temperature had risen from that blanket of cold air that we all experienced in the UK over the past couple of weeks. Let's hope that's gone.